Hey guys, how's it going? Kevin Cleary here with a discussion video for you. Today I want to talk a little bit about firearms. I've got this total gun manual that someone gave me a while back. They know I do some hunting and uh, some target shooting, skeet shooting, stuff like that. So they saw this book somewhere. Um, I don't know how old it is. I don't know, you know how many of you watching may be aware of this book or not. I can't really fully endorse it. There's a lot of good stuff in here and there's a couple things that that I'm not totally in love with as well. But either way, I thought this would serve as a pretty good backdrop for our discussion. I want to talk about the fact about the the current legislation and even in the US where there's a democratic government in place which um you know and, and Democrats have in some cases hinted at the fact they'd like to have some some gun laws in place. And and look, I want to begin by saying this. I, I get it. Right? Why would you want to ban firearms? Well, there are there are a, there are a lot of reasons. Now, primarily, they're reasons of personal safety. And look, we're all painfully and fearfully aware that there is gun violence that takes place in many major cities in North America. I'm in Canada, so we're primarily talking about Toronto, a little bit in Hamilton, uh, a few other large cities, Vancouver, but. In the U.S., there are, there's a much longer list of cities where gun violence takes place. And it's a scary thought to think that, you know, if I live in one of those cities or I'm visiting one of those cities, I could or my children could or my loved ones could be subject to that violence. And, and, and you know, I don't want to have to worry about that. And no one, I don't think, wants to worry about the, the fact that while they're walking down the street or doing business in a store or who knows, that someone could pull out a gun and use it. Maybe they mean to, you know, to shoot someone else. Maybe they're using it for a robbery of the store that you happen to be in. Whatever the case may be, someone pulls out a gun and, and bullets start flying. And, and now me or my loved ones uh, or, you know, someone close to me is hurt or injured or even dead. You know, no one wants that. No one uh, enjoys the thought of that even being a possibility. And, and so... I totally get the instinct to say, well, is there something we can do to take away that possibility, right? I don't want to worry about being mugged. I don't want to worry about, you know, people breaking into my house that are armed. Um, I don't want to worry. You know, I've, we've all seen movies, right, where, you know, the, the family's sleeping snugly in bed and these armed intruders come in and take over the house and, you know, the the family is is powerless to stop them because they've got firearms. And so, uh, you know, it seems like the the... The thing to do would be take those guns away. Um, we we have stories of children being shot in schools and and people in theaters and uh, and you know kids getting shot in their own living rooms because of gang violence and all of those things are terrible, right? We we want to not have to worry about that. We want to feel safer. We want the world to be safer. We don't want to see people hurt. And so it seems simple, right? Let's just ban guns. And then I won't have to be, you know, laying awake at night hoping that bullets don't start flying through my my house. I have a brick house, so it's probably not likely, but you you, you get the point. And in certain neighborhoods, that's a really that's a real thing. All right, um, you know, the thought I guess is that maybe if we ban guns, if we take those guns away, no one will be able to get them and use them to rob people, to kidnap people, to, you know, commit assault or rape or whatever else, whatever other nefarious activity they want to be involved with. So uh, let's let's start from there and say, look, I don't want to live in fear. And I understand that others don't want to live in fear. Is the Is the solution, is the way to alleviate that fear to take people's guns away, to make sure that no one can have a gun? All right. Um, the, there may be some, let's, let's think through this because while that on the very face of it, just say, Hey, take away all the guns and then everything will be fine. That, that sounds reasonable. And certainly from the perspective of, I don't want to have to worry about it. I don't want to be fearful for my life or the life of my loved ones from that perspective. Hey, that's, that's, I don't think anyone, I, whatever side of this discussion you're on, whether you're the most avid, avid second amendment defender who's ever lived, uh, that, that person doesn't, I, by the way, I'm Canadian. So the second amendment is not a thing for me. Um, but uh, even someone watching this in the U.S. who who has a huge collection of guns and, and is a, a huge advocate for the Second Amendment, they don't want to live in fear either. They don't want their loved ones shot. They don't want your loved ones shot. They don't want anyone harmed in any way. That's 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 something we all agree on. So let's start from that that um, 
position. And the next question then to ask is, is the way to alleviate that fear, is the way to, you know, end gun crime and end street violence and muggings and rapings and every other thing that happens, is the way to fix all that to remove firearms from the equation? All right. And that's where we do need to think a little bit further about this, because I, I know that sounds like it might be a solution, but there are other questions that we need to ask that they kind of flow naturally out of that. OK, the first thing is, you know, while we know there are definitely dangerous and harmful uses of firearms, uh, would we be taking away a tool that's useful and has some good uses? Right. And and I think the very first, right on the very first thing I want you to think about is would the would the good outweigh the bad or the bad outweigh the good here? Okay, if if firearms were removed from the equation, would we lose more than we gain? All right. Now I'm not answering that question yet. I'm just asking you to think about that. Um, so are there any good, healthy, beneficial? uses for firearms. So that's one of the things we need to think about. The second thing we need to think about is if we undergo this effort to take away all the guns, is that possible, right? Is it possible to stop people from getting things that, that we don't want them to have that we don't think they should have? Let's, let's flip through this book a little bit so that the, the background is changing. There's a page here somewhere that shows a whole bunch of rifles that I thought might be fun to take a look at. Here we go. So this shows a variety of stuff over here. We have something that's probably on the ban list. Okay. Uh, what's interesting, by the way, is these two firearms, they look different, but their function is exactly the same. And very likely this one shoots a larger round than this one. That is, this one shoots a more damaging um, projectile than this one does. All right, there's a few more over here that we can look at. This gun is absolutely beautiful, I have to say. Um, so, let's see. There's a page that has more firearms on it than this that I wanted to show you guys. Eh, that's not it anyway. That's fine. We'll just go with whatever we kind of came up with. Here's a nice lever action to take a look at. So, let's, let's kind of think through some of these other questions. So, um, the next thing I said, is it possible to take something away? And the next, after that, if we say, yeah, it is possible, or maybe it's not, um, we have to ask the question, will violent crime like murder and assault, um, rape, uh, robbery, will these things be curbed? Okay, will there be some diminishment in those crimes if we remove the tool that's being used to commit the violence? Uh, furthermore, what impact does does available availability of firearms have on crime in general, right? If, if uh, does more guns equal more crime? Do more guns equal less crime? You know, does it equal more murders, less murders? What's, what's the deal with that? All right. And even if it's proven that firearms do contribute to violence, uh, what consideration should we give to human rights? That is, you know, in a free society, I can, I can own what I want. I can do what I want. I'm not, the, the government doesn't give me permission okay, to own certain things or do certain things. In a free society, I'm automatically allowed to do everything. Uh, it's only under certain circumstances, very limited circumstances, that the government has a role to, to limit my freedom in some way. All right, so those are all considerations. Should the government be allowed to limit a person's freedom through, uh, through firearm laws, okay? So let's let's get into this. First off, uh, let's let's hit on the stuff related to criminal behavior because frankly, that's what we're mostly concerned about. All right, you know, I know there are those watching this who who go, you know, there's no such thing as a good gun; they should all be taken away. Um, but I doubt that's probably most of you. Most of you are like, no, there there are good, useful roles for firearms. So that we'll save that till the end. But let's talk about the criminal side first. Is it? And the first thing I want to ask is, is it possible to stop people from getting the stuff we don't want them to have? All right. And, and look, this is actually a fairly obvious one. The easy answer to this is no, it's definitely not. Right. We've had a war on drugs in North America for years. And guess what? 
we don't see a big drop in drug use. In fact, some have argued that it's been increasing over the last couple of years. We saw during Prohibition that when, when the government decided we're not going to let anyone have alcohol, that wasn't super effective. By the way, in case you're thinking that this scary gun could not possibly be for hunting, here's a guy hunting with his AR-15 right there. Um, that's not what I, the, that's not the discussion we're having right now, but I just want to point out that that is a thing. All right. Um, so prohibition indicates no. And in fact, in countries where they have really strict gun laws, where no one's allowed to own a firearm, you still have criminals and criminal gangs who have and use firearms and commit acts of violence with those firearms. All right. So, uh, and in fact, um, there's a company, Norinco, who can do business in Canada but is not allowed to do business in the U.S. because they were caught selling. They're a manufacturer, and they were caught, or you know, there's a they were stopped from doing business in the U.S. because uh, they were caught selling directly to a gang rather than you know going through legal channels. So uh, I think that's that's something that we need to kind of keep in the back of our minds that you know even if we ban guns totally that would not effectively keep firearms out of the hands of criminals because they don't they don't care about obeying the law if they feel like they need a firearm to do the criminal activities that they need to do they're going to do whatever they they have to do to get a hold of one all right um, and we already know, right, they're willing to smuggle, they're willing to steal, they're willing to do whatever they, they need to do. Um, so it's a little cliche at this point, and I'm aware of that, but that does mean that when you hear firearm rights groups or firearm, firearm advocates claim that if you ban guns, only criminals will have guns, they're, they're right in saying that. And, and it's because criminals are not going to obey the gun ban. Now, let's move on from that. Okay, so first point is, can we stop people from getting stuff we don't want them to get? And the fact is, probably not. Only people who will obey the law are going to not buy guns if you tell them not to. All right, moving on. Uh, what about our question related to guns and violence? And, and that is, let's, let's imagine, you know, use your, pretend with me for a moment that you're getting ready to commit a, a jewelry store robbery or bank robbery. I don't care which one. And you think, you know, I need a firearm. I'm going to get a gun. I'm going to hold up the bank. I'm going to hold up the jewelry store. Great. You find that you're not able to get your hands on a gun. Well, do you at that point immediately say to yourself, you know, well, I guess I'm not going to commit this crime. Or, or would you say, well, I couldn't commit the crime the way I wanted to, but I still need the money. I still want to... I still want to commit this crime. I'm just going to find another way of achieving it. By the way, these are a bunch of different bullets. We could do a whole discussion just about um, various ammunition sizes and all of that stuff. That's not really the, the thr thrust of this discussion. So if you're going to commit a crime, you're going to use a firearm, but then you couldn't get it. Would you say, well, I guess I'm not committing that crime? Or would you find another means? You know, let's imagine you're a, you're a drug dealer on, on the streets and, you know, your competition is moving into your air area. Do you say to yourself, uh, I've got to, you know, you, you, you say, hey, I'm going to throw down with this guy. I'm going to stop this guy from getting into my territory. Let me get some firearms. You go, well, man, I can't find any guns. Are you going to be like, well, I guess I'll have to negotiate. Uh, or I guess I'll have to give in my, my territory. You know, probably not. You're probably going to say, well, I'm going to find some other means to do that. And the same is true of of numerous other crimes, whether it be breaking and entering, committing, you know, a violent rape or assault, kidnapping, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, you're going to look for another alternative. Um, and, and, you know, I this this does beg the question or kind of bring up the question what about uh the the connection between the availability of firearms and crime rate and the fact is in that discussion you know when sociologists who research that they don't really talk about a correlation between the availability of firearms and the you know, the, the violent crime rate. That's not really a thing. There are other social factors and cultural factors that contribute to crime rate um, to a much greater degree. And, it, you know, it's, it's arguable that, um, or it's suggested anyway by some of the reading that I've done that it's, there's almost no effect in terms of whether or not a person can get a gun or not, whether they're, they're going to commit a crime. 
So just on based on those two simple points alone, we can sort of establish that strict or stricter gun laws are not likely to have a significant impact on violent crime. Now, there are other points to be considered. So I don't want to stop there. I want to go on for a couple more minutes. I know we're getting long, but I'm not quite done yet. Uh, we know there are evil uses for firearms. We know there are bad people who commit violent acts. Uh, and there, there's no question about that. In fact, we arm police and we arm the military because we understand the value of firearms as a defensive tool against those those nefarious individuals who want to use firearms that way. All right. But that's not the only use in terms of, you know, a defensive role for firearms. Civilians benefit from firearms as a defensive tool. Farmers, you know, I live in a rural area and farmers have long defended their livestock and their property from dangerous and destructive animals. Furthermore, even in Canada, it's been acknowledged that, you know, we have some, some rural places here. Uh, in fact, I, I had coffee a few couple years ago with an RCMP officer who, who works in rural Alberta. Alberta. And, you know, he's like, I'm 45 minutes away from a call. And it's been acknowledged that in those situations, the availability of a firearm for a homeowner in terms of, you know, someone coming on his property that's not welcome is imperative. So uh, there's a there's a legitimate defensive use for firearms, even for, you know, in Canada, where that's really not listed as a as a legal justifiable use. Uh, it is still a thing. Um, in the U.S., where you can carry a concealed firearm and where firearm use is, uh, firearm availability is perhaps higher or more likely. All right, um, is there is there a legitimate role in that degree? And, and I think there is. Again, um, so to, statistically, there are two studies. They're miles apart. So I'm going to give you both numbers. You know, you can decide. But on the low end, one study found that about 300,000 times a year, the the presence of a firearm stops a crime from taking place. Another study uh, under the Obama administration found in 2 million times a year, crimes are stopped because of the presence of a firearm. In, in addition to these numbers, I think we have to also think of how many criminals stop short of entering a house or a vehicle because the occupant may be armed. Uh, and so I think there's, there is, you know, on the good side, if we're, if we're having a, you know, for weighing pros and cons here on the good side, there is a legitimate defensive use for firearms. And this is more, um, what would you say, more important or more relevant for people who may be less able to defend themselves for some reason? So, you know, maybe this is an elderly person who can't physically stop someone. Maybe it's a, a, a person who's smaller in stature, either a small per, a small man, a woman who, you know, is going to have less musculature than, than your average man. Uh, what about people with disabilities? Maybe, you know, an injury or even someone who's, who's limited to a wheelchair, you know, and I don't relish this thought of needing a firearm for self-defense, but until that role is considered, we haven't really examined the issue. Um, and, and actually, I should, think there's one other point that should be added here. There are many people who've been, been involved in some kind of violent attack, either by a human or by an animal, who have subsequently adopted the practice of carrying a firearm in response to their ordeal. And, and you know, I, I don't think we who, you know, are able to, what would you say, live in fairly safe circumstances uh, or who have never experienced that kind of violence inflicted on us can criticize that person's choice. All right. Uh, and of course, defense is not the only use for firearms. In fact, it's not even, uh, it's not even, you know, in the top, <laughs> you know, if you thought how many times is a firearm used in, in a year in Canada uh, or in the U.S. And of that, you know, what percentage is a defensive use or, or you know, used, even, even if you include police in those numbers, right, there are, there are much, much, much more common uses for firearms uh, whether in North America. Okay, so hunting is, of course, a major one. But hunting even, you know, when you go hunting, you're going to shoot your gun like one time. But I know tons of people, and I myself and my children and my family and my friends and my neighbors, lots of us, uh, take advantage of local shooting ranges, local farms uh, for target shooting and competition. Uh, and I don't do any kind of IPSC shooting or, or anything like that, or three gun competitions or skeet shooting. But those are all, those are probably, those probably account for by far the most 
uh, discharges of a firearm per year in every country around the world, right? You think about your average skeet shoot, how many rounds are going to be fired off. You think about a three gun competition or a, a practical shooting course, how many, how many rounds are going to be fired off. And so that's by far the most common use of firearms in many, many countries. And of course, you know, um, skeet shooting or clay shooting and uh, biathlon are both Olympic events that involve shooting firearms. Right? So there are a lot of legitimate uses of firearms that millions of people from millions of different backgrounds and walks of life and, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds enjoy that are way outside of uh, any kind of, you know, defensive or offensive use. Now, I, one more point that I should have brought up a minute ago, and that is the point that, you know, virtually every free society recognizes self-defense as a basic human right. And for some people, the only way to effectively defend themselves would be with the use of a firearm. And so I think there is a legitimate argument to be made based on human rights that restricting people's ability to own, especially handguns that they could carry on their person, uh, would be a human rights violation. All right, so there are significant upsides to the use and ownership of firearms and tons and tons of activities that are healthy and normal and fun and bring society together and contribute to the economy and contribute to society and culture as a whole, right? There's all of, there, there are a lot of things that firearms do that are good. One last point that we haven't yet considered, and that is what about human freedom? Okay, in Western civilization, we value human freedom. We value the ability of individuals to do what they want, when they want, to live as they please. And this includes the freedom to place oneself in potential danger, right? If you start thinking about the activities that people do for fun that could harm them or harm someone else, it's a long, long list, okay? Everything from skydiving and bungee jumping to flying drones to, you know, riding snowmobiles and motorcycles and, and every kind of off-road vehicle you could think of. People climb mountains. They ski down those same mountains. They go hiking, camping, boating, swimming. All of these activities kill a certain number of people every year. And we don't talk about restricting them or banning them or anything along those lines. This is the, sh this is the picture I should have been showing when we were talking about uh, the, um, when we were talking about uh, defensive use of firearms. Here's a, a here's an a x-ray, if you will, I don't know what the right word is I'm looking for, uh, a technical drawing, I guess, of an AR-15. For those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, you can pause this and take a look or go and buy this book uh, and take a look at this picture. But uh, my point is that it's legal to do all of these things. And in fact, these are not extreme examples. These don't kill tons and tons of people. But um, in Canada, around 2,000 people a year die in auto, auto accidents. In the U.S., it's like 30, 40 some thousand, around 40,000. Um, and, and we're not talking about restricting the use of, of motor vehicles. Okay, we're, we're happy to make that trade-off because we recognize that there's value and utility in having cars available for people. Um, another good example is alcohol. Alcohol use uh, kills 3 million people a year around the world and compare that to uh, firearms. And of course, think about wars and, and, you know, coups and some of the violent countries like Haiti that exist out there. Um, 250,000 people a year in firearm deaths compared to 3 million a year because of alcohol. All right. So that's just just to point out that there are tons of dangerous activities and we don't look at something and go, hey, this killed someone. We got to stop it. Right? And I often hear that argument in ter terms of firearm laws. Well, if this saves one person, well, the fact is, if you are going to, s to you know, stop using anything that could save one person, we wouldn't be able to leave the house. You'd have to stop driving. You'd have to stop drinking water. You'd have to stop eating food because choking kills us bunches of people. You'd have to stop swimming and hiking and biking and walking. And the list would just go on and on and on and on if your thought was, well, if we can save one person by doing this, right? Because the fact is there are lots of activities that kill more than one person uh, per year. All right. And in fact, firearms aren't even a great comparison here because the safe and legal use of firearms is 
way safer than all these other activities. You're not, you have to, you have to do something wrong. You have to mess up seriously in order to uh, injure yourself or someone else with a firearm or be using it illegally. Okay. So the legal use of firearms is completely safe, right? Uh, it's unlike, let's say skiing, you could be doing everything right when you're skiing and you're catching edge and break your neck. Okay. Uh, even though everything's fine in the same is true of a number of other activities, riding your bike or driving a car, you could be doing everything right and still end up dead with a firearm. That can't happen. If you're doing everything right, you are a hundred percent safe. Okay. So when it comes to banning firearms, and I didn't get into the specific ban. Okay. That wasn't the purpose of this video. It was to philosophically think about this and try to find some common ground. And, and hopefully if you're not a gun person, this will give you a little bit of insight into where gun people are coming from. And I'll admit, I'm not a huge, you know, rootin' tootin' Yosemite Sam gun guy. Uh, I enjoy the mechanical nature and precision of firearms. I enjoy working on my skills and being able to shoot accurately. And I apply that through hunting and target shooting. But I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not, you know, I don't have guns in every room of my house and I'm not taking my guns apart and cleaning them every day. I'm more of a knife guy, actually. Uh, so I thought, perhaps that this would be helpful to some of you either one if you're you're trying to to reach out to a friend or family member who is anti-gun uh, or if you're watching this and maybe you have a different view of guns than me i'd love to have a discussion with you uh down in the comments section please just keep in mind the comment section has to be free from cursing or i'm just going to delete your comment and it has to be respectful if you start ad hominem attacks and that kind of thing i'm just going to delete your comment all right thanks a lot for watching don't forget to like and subscribe yeah, if you're a gun guy, this is probably, you know, I mostly talk about pocket knives, so you may not want to actually subscribe. I'm encouraging you to do it because I'll maybe convert you to a knife guy. But anyway, uh, again, thanks for watching. We'll talk to you soon.